Okay, so uh, thank you very much to the uh, organisers and the multi-level uh, CTO uh, course group for their kind invitation to uh, present a case. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, CTO PCI in the COVID-19 uh, era uh, and discuss a case. I'm uh, Dr Khan, I'm one of the co uh, consultant cardiologists working in the city of uh, Birmingham in the uh, UK. So if you have a look at the uh, number of patients who are admitted to our uh, hospital, we were probably one of the busiest hospitals in uh, Europe. At one stage, we had uh, nearly 200 uh, ventilated patients uh, uh, on our intensive care unit and over 700 inpatients with a uh, diagnosis of uh, uh, COVID-19. Now, of course, uh, during a pandemic, uh, routine cardiology and emergency cardiology work does not uh, stop. So we were still uh, fortunate enough to be able to offer uh, emergency uh, cardiology work during this time. So what I've got today is a, a discussion around a 90-year-old uh, gentleman who was admitted uh, to our hospital. He has a prior history of uh, high blood pressure and he's previously been thrombolyzed uh, for a myocardial infarction in the early 1990s. Now, uh, this gentleman is very robust. He normally walks two to three miles a day, and he was admitted with sudden onset, severe retrosternal chest pain whilst he was out on uh, one of these walks. His uh, ECG had shown uh, first degree heart block with uh, right bundle branch block, and he had uh, Q waves uh, in the anterior leads affecting leads uh, V1, V2 and V3. Uh, high sensitive troponin was only minimally uh, elevated at uh, 53 on the first uh, uh, measurement and 64 on the second measurement. Now he underwent an echocardiogram which showed normal LV size with only mildly impaired LV function. Ejection fraction was around 45% and he had uh, regional wall uh, motion abnormality with hypokinesia of the uh, anterior segment. So this was slightly out of keeping with the finding of the Q waves on his uh, 12 BBCG. Now, given the fact that he was a, a robust gentleman, he was offered uh, invasive coronary angiogram. Uh, this is the procedure that was performed from the right radial artery approach. Uh, and you can see he's got a big dominant right coronary artery uh, and septal collaterals, uh, which are faintly filling this uh, occluded uh, LAD. So in the spider view, we can see that he's got some tapering disease in the left main stem uh, with uh, osteal disease in the LAD. And then after this uh, large first uh, diagonal, he has a calcification, which is uh, visible in the LAD, uh, a tapering within to the uh, occluded segment, uh, which is then uh, completely uh, occluded and no flow uh, on the AP cranial uh, view. So really the, the uh, uh, case uh, centers around uh, strategy and how we would go about uh, treating this gentleman. Now, in a normal situation, of course, what we would have done is probably think about taking this gentleman off the table uh, having a more uh, informed discussion with him uh, and maybe considering assessing for uh, viability uh, within that LAD territory, possibly with a, a cardiac MRI scan. Now, as it happened, uh, because of uh, the fact that uh, uh, we were in the middle of a pandemic, we did not have available to us um, the uh, cardiac MR uh, scanning machine. The other option, of course, was to uh, proceed directly to uh, PCI uh, given his recent symptoms uh, and the assumption that this is probably an acute lesion which has uh, caused his uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome uh, and it, of course the lesion is also uh, uh, in uh, keeping with what we found uh, on his ECG and his uh, echocardiogram. Well, the other thing of course we have to remember unfortunately was that uh, uh, many patients who succumbed to COVID-19 uh, were elderly individuals. So we wanted to, a strategy which meant that we could treat him uh, quickly uh, and hopefully uh, discharge him uh, without too much of a uh, stay within our hospital. So uh, 
what we did uh, was that we proceeded to uh, PCI uh, at the same uh, sitting, in fact, uh, for this uh, gentleman. Uh, we gained access to the right uh, femoral artery using uh, ultrasound and a micropuncture needle and a 7 French uh, VL 3.5 guide catheter was introduced into the uh, left main stem. Now the strategy was to, to bring up a microcatheter. Here we've got a, a Caraval microcatheter uh, over a run-through wire and then I probed the uh, proximal uh, lesion uh, with a fielder XTR wire uh, and then subsequently a uh, polymer jacketed uh, Pilot 200 wire. On dual injection, uh, you can see that actually the occlusion is uh, quite short, uh, but there is calcification. Um, and because of that, unfortunately, it was clear on the uh, second panel here, you can see that we've entered the uh, sub intimal uh, space uh, um, with our microcatheter. So the options really at this stage are to uh, uh, think about uh, possibly um, uh, redir redirecting a wire back into the uh, uh, true lumen. Uh, we could think about a parallel wire uh, and bringing up a, a second microcatheter. Uh, we will have a, a seven French here. Uh, what we elected to do here was to uh, move to an anti-grade dissection re-entry strategy with a dedicated uh, device. Uh, and this dedicated device we chose to use was the uh, Stingray balloon. So over a, a Miracle 6 wire, uh, we were able then to introduce the uh, Stingray balloon. Uh, remember, the, the Stingray balloon has to be uh, prepped adequately uh, off the table uh, as, uh, so that you can uh, actually see the uh, balloon uh, because it has a, uh, a small amount of contrast that is uh, uh, taken in. Now remember that the balloon is a self-orientating uh, balloon which sits in the uh, subintimal space and there are uh, two exit ports at 180 degree uh, um, to each other uh, opposed and these are offset ports. So the first port is just uh, proximal to the two uh, radio opaque markers. Uh, the second port is uh, in between the two uh, radio opaque markers. So with a uh, Stingray wire, uh, uh, which is a 0.014 wire uh, with a uh, barb at the end, we were able to uh, negotiate this wire and you can see in the first uh, instance, what happens is that the uh, wire exits uh, from the middle uh, port, which is going in the wrong direction, where in the LAO cranial view here, uh, I then bring the wire back, uh, uh, give it a 180 uh, degree turn, and, and, and able, able to come out from the more proximal uh, port. And as I did that, I could feel a uh, pop as it went back in to the uh, true lumen uh, of the uh, uh, vessel here. Uh, now we advanced this only a small amount uh, and then we went for what is known as a, a stick and swap uh, uh, strategy. So the uh, uh, Stingray wire was then uh, removed and I exchanged this to a, a Pilot 200 wire. And fortunately the Pilot 200 wire uh, was not uh, uh, taking the course uh, down the vessel. Uh, that is a little bit of a concern. Uh, and I also tried the Fielder XT uh, and uh, came up with the uh, same fate. So eventually I took a, a Gaia second uh, wire, uh, which uh, has a little bit more uh, body to it. And you can see uh, as I advanced this down the vessel, it went uh, very easily uh, down the vessel and the wire itself is uh, jumping uh, in time uh, with the contractions of the uh, left ventricle. So I felt fairly confident that uh, the wire was uh, in the uh, uh, correct uh, plane here. Now, uh, having said that, we can't be a hundred percent confident that that is the case. Uh, so what I elected to do was to advance uh, ultrasound uh, uh, probe over the uh, uh, Gaia second wire uh, to uh, confirmed that I was in the uh, true lumen. 
Uh, so what is the IVUS showing here? Well, the IVUS is showing that uh, I am actually, in fact, in the true lumen here. The size of the vessel is uh, probably a little bit uh, over two millimeters. We start to see some uh, speckles of uh, uh, calcification. And as we uh, came back, uh, we began to appreciate that there was also a hematoma uh, within the actual uh, vessel itself uh, surrounding the uh, true lumen, which you can see here uh, from uh, around seven o'clock uh, to uh, one o'clock. Now, reassuringly, as we were coming back, we could see uh, side branches coming off. Uh, and then here uh, around six o'clock, what you appreciate is that uh, uh, probably the true lumen is uh, down here at uh, six o'clock. Uh, and you start seeing that the IVUS is probably in a sub uh, interval uh, space. Now, uh, we then pulled the IVUS probe uh, further back. And as we did so, uh, what we could see was that uh, the uh, IVUS probe came back into the uh, true lumen uh, more proximally. And I'm just going to bring this on a little bit uh, just to show you that the, the atheroma extended all the way back into the uh, uh, and involving the uh, left main stem. So we're coming up at uh, uh, 12 o'clock. We've got the ostium of the uh, circumflex, and this is the uh, left main stem. So the left main stem is uh, atheromatous, but our areas here were uh, adequate. So with that in mind, uh, we see this quite often actually that the the wire will track uh, intraplaque and the, into the lumen and possibly back out again. But the important thing here was that the wire distally was in the uh, true lumen. So I was happy then uh, to proceed to uh, treat this. Uh, the other thing to note was that our retrograde injections were not really helping to confirm whether or not the wire was in the true lumen. And I think the IVUS was uh, of uh, um, very good use here in terms of uh, trying to confirm that we were in fact true lumen. So over the Caraval microcatheter, I uh, switched out to a workhorse wire. Here we've put the run-through wire down. The vessel was uh, pre-dilated. The IVUS had given us the information that we did not need to use any calcification uh, uh, modifying tools such as uh, intravascular lithotripsy uh, or uh, uh, rotablation. And then two stents were deployed and Obviously, we had used the IVUS to determine the diameter of those stents. So the first one was a 2.5 millimeter uh, diameter stent, uh, quite a long one. And the second one was a uh, 3 millimeter uh, diameter stent. And this, uh, we came back into the uh, ostium of the uh, LED with that. The stents were then uh, post dilated with uh, 2.75 non-compliant balloons and a 3.5 in the uh, proximal uh, segment of the LED. And then, of course, uh, since we had the IVUS uh, available, we went ahead um, and repeated our IVUS run, really to check that we had good expansion of the uh, stent. On the angiogram, you could see there was a little bit of a step down uh, where the stent had uh, landed, but there was no indication of a uh, distal edge uh, dissection. Uh, the minimal stent area here in the distal segment uh, was around four millimeters squared uh, and more than uh, seven uh, and a half millimeters squared in the uh, proximal segment. So as I just uh, run this IVUS on, uh, the uh, important thing to note was that we had come back uh, with one strut into the uh, left main stem. So at uh, 12 o'clock, you see the circumflex. This is the uh, left main stem. This is where the atheroma was. You can see that the stent is uh, under expanded here, although it is well opposed. There was no proximal edge uh, dissection reassuringly. So we went ahead and we post dilated this uh, with a, a 4.5 uh, non-compliant uh, balloon. So that was a, a very good uh, result for this gentleman. Um, uh, you know, we had changed our practice during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we are now uh, out of that uh, first wave and we're now able to, uh, uh, well, with limitations in terms of uh, patient uh, numbers, we are able to offer our services back again to uh, our patients. 
around the time of the uh, pandemic, obviously, one of the concerns was the uh, risk of uh, picking up a infection uh, whilst uh, uh, patients were in hospital. Uh, so for this particular gentleman, we wanted to minimise his time in hospital. He is uh, elderly, elderly and at uh, extreme risk of uh, picking up COVID-19 in the hospital setting. Um, there is this issue about consent, uh, and we decided that actually all patients who were going to come to the uh, cath lab during this uh, time uh, for a case were going to be consented uh, for complex uh, PCI uh, should the need uh, arise. And that uh, meant that uh, we could adequately proceed uh, in this gentleman's case uh, to a complex uh, PCI procedure uh, using uh, dual access. So what I've uh, demonstrated here is the use of uh, anti-grade wire escalation uh, and then uh, switching out quickly to a, a dissection re-entry strategy uh, with the Stingray uh, balloon. Uh, and this meant that we could uh, perform this case uh, efficiently and quickly with a favorable outcome. The other thing I want to highlight is of course that uh, the IVUS was uh, very helpful uh, in this case, not only to confirm that our wire was in the uh, true lumen uh, distally, uh, but also uh, to optimize our stents and to ensure that uh, in this uh, uh, non-genarian that we used as uh, little contrast as uh, possible. So uh, thank you once again to the uh, organizers and I, I hope that uh, uh, you've enjoyed uh, our case from uh, Birmingham, uh, UK. Thank you.